Good evening. I am Dr. D. Silver. I'm a neurologist and movement disorder specialist at Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla, California. Our topic tonight is current causes and treatment of memory loss. I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Cummings of UCLA and Dr. Kravitz for the use of some of these slides for tonight's presentation. Now, what's the purpose of our discussion tonight on memory loss? It's really for you. And here's what we want you to think about. We want to give you information and education for you and your family. We want to have clarity of the issues of memory loss. We want to have a better understanding and a realistic approach to dementias. We know there is progress going on and we want to give you hope. We realize that knowledge is power and knowledge is also hope. Be aware that in all aspects of our lives, there is reason to prepare for the future. And that is true for patients with dementia and their families. So what's the outline for tonight's talk on memory loss? We're going to talk about six important areas. Terminology, Alzheimer's disease, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. We're going to discuss tests and biomarkers for diagnosis. And we're going to talk about treatment. We're going to talk about what's available now, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and the glutamate antagonists. And we're going to talk about the future, altering the amyloid cascade or the amyloid hypothesis. And then we're going to briefly touch on stem cells. So let's talk about terminology. We oftentimes get confused by big words, so let's discuss a few of them. What does dementia mean? Well, dementia is memory loss with associated signs and symptoms of various types. Dementia is a broad category of diseases. It's a waste paper basket disease. But Alzheimer's disease, also called dementia of the Alzheimer's type, is cognitive dysfunction with memory loss plus one of three symptoms. Aphasia, which is difficulty with speech, apraxia, which is difficulty with motor activity, and movement and coordinated activity, and agnosia, which is difficulty with recognition. What's Lewy body disease? Well, Lewy body disease is memory loss, it's Parkinson's disease with signs and symptoms, and it's fluctuating attention and alertness with hallucinations. So it's really different than Parkinson's disease. It's a dementia called Lewy body disease. Now, we now know a term called frontal temporal dementia. It wasn't used much before a number of years ago, but this is a group of people that have dementia. They're younger. They have a younger onset with their dementia. They have behavior changes, memory loss, personality changes, sometimes a sociopathic kind of personality change. That's frontal temporal dementia. Parkinson's disease dementia is actually Parkinson's disease patients that have known Parkinson's disease, rigidity, akinesia, resting tremor. But they also have dementia, but it usually occurs usually two years after they've had the onset of their Parkinson's. Of interest, patients with Parkinson's disease, about 80% of them in eight to 10 years will have some cognitive impairment. Then there's the hot topic called normal pressure hydrocephalus. That's a triad of incontinence of the bladder, ataxia or balance difficulty, and dementia. And if you have that normal pressure hydrocephalus, sometimes you can put a shunt in the ventricles and drain the fluid into the peritoneal cavity. Now, neuropsychiatric changes occur in dementia, and we call these behavioral changes in dementia. And what are they? Apathy or being withdrawn, agitation, aggressiveness, delusions, depression, compulsions, and hallucinations. Then comes a term that's very important now for the amyloid hypothesis or the amyloid cascade, and that is amyloid precursor protein. It's a transmembrane protein that goes into the membrane, and it's part of the membrane, that generates beta amyloid by being cleaved by beta secretase or gamma secretase, and we'll talk about that more later. But amyloid precursor protein is a precursor to beta amyloid. And this is also called amyloid beta. And it's made up of numbers of proteins. Two are beta amyloid 140 and beta amyloid 142. 
It's the 142 that really comprises most of the senile plaque or the amyloid in the senile plaque, and it's the toxic part. It aggregates, it's in a diffusional state in the cell early, then it aggregates more, accumulates intracellularly, the cell dies, and there's a senile plaque made up of beta amyloid. And this is a picture of beta amyloid plaques or the senile plaques. The red area is stained for amyloid, and that's what a senile plaque looks like a hallmark pathological finding in people with Alzheimer's disease. Another hallmark of the pathology of Alzheimer's is neurofibrillary tangles, NFTs. They're made of TAW, another kind of protein. And this TAW is a paired helical filament of abnormally hyperphosphorylated TAW, too much phosphorylation of this protein, and that is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. And neurofibrillary tangles are actually in neurons as they advance in the disease of Alzheimer's. And this neuron is a cell body that has an axon that looks like a tail that releases a neurotransmitter when it's healthy that sends a message to another cell's receptor at the postsynaptic receptor site, giving an informational message carried by some chemical product like a neurotransmitter. Now this is a picture of TAW associated with microtubules. And you can see the microtubule, and TAW is bound there to the microtubule. And later on, it's hyperphosphorylated, and it's in this helical appearance. So the neurofibrillary tangle here is very important. It is seen in this cell, as you can see, the dark red stain in the cell. You can see that little tail, that's the axon. And this neurofibrillary tangle is an abnormal finding and is consistent with Alzheimer's disease. Now a couple other terminologies are the alpha-synuclein, it's a protein aggregated, and it forms Lewy bodies, and it's seen in Parkinson's disease. Now important to remember about proteins, genes dictate proteins. So genes govern the way proteins are made. And neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are protein deposition diseases. That's why we have beta amyloid in Alzheimer's. Now mutations in genes give abnormal proteins. And these mutations often allow the proteins to be more likely to aggregate, which is pathological. Now today we have knockout mice that are mice that are genetically changed to express excessive amyloid so they can study amyloid deposition and try out various medicines. So mutations in genes that develop proteins like beta amyloid tau and alpha synuclein give protein changes that lead to diseases. So we've talked about some terminology. We're going to discuss that a little bit more, but let's talk about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is characterized by the development of multiple cognitive deficits manifested by one memory impairment in one of the three following features, aphasia, language disturbance, difficulty getting words out, apraxia, impaired ability to carry out motor activities, and agnosia, failure to recognize or identify objects. And often people have disturbance of what we call executive function, planning, organization, abstract difficulties that really occur. Now in Alzheimer's patients, age is the greatest risk factor. And as the population ages, you get more cases of Alzheimer's. There are probably five million patients with Alzheimer's in the United States now. And for every one that is diagnosed, there's probably one I'm diagnosed. And there's gonna be 15 million in about 2050. The cases double every five years. So if you have a 1 to 2 percent or 2 to 3 percent incidence at 65, it goes up to 4 to 6 percent at 70 and so on. At 85, about 40 percent of the patients will have some degree of Alzheimer's disease. It's an expensive disease, 150 billion a year. Now this is a picture again of beta amyloid, that red stain, protein, pathological. And this is a picture of the neurofibrillary tangle, a protein, tau, again pathological for people who have Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk briefly about the amyloid hypothesis. The amyloid K2 
cascade, amyloid precursor protein to beta amyloid. This is the new consideration of what's going on with Alzheimer's. So what we have here is a cleavage of the amyloid precursor protein by various substances to form amyloid. And you can see in this cartoon, we have the amyloid precursor protein, a protein that is involved in the membrane of the cell. It's cleaved first by beta secretase, which is a secretase, it cleaves part of the protein off the APP, and then it's cleaved by gamma secretase, and it's the accumulation of the amyloid beta protein in the brain that we think is the primary event in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, and it's very prone to aggregate. Now this is from a recent article. It talks about targeting amyloid in various areas so we can therapeutically manage Alzheimer's disease. And we can see here on the left the amyloid precursor protein, the protein involved in the membrane, it's a transmembrane protein, and then you get a cleavage, a part of the protein, by the beta secretase. And that causes part of the protein to be broken off. Then you have the gamma secretase that actually cleaves off another part of this amyloid precursor protein and gives you, without question, beta amyloid. That beta amyloid, then, is excessive in amount, and then it can aggregate. So how can we get involved in therapeutically managing this cascade? Well, first of all, we can block the production, where the circles are, of A beta protein, or A beta 42 amyloid production. So we block beta secretase or block gamma secretase. That gives lower amounts of amyloid beta protein. Or we can lower the production of the toxic aspects of this fragment in some way. Another way to consider to get some type of intervention therapeutically is to decrease the amyloid beta aggregation, to not allow it to be so aggregated, which we think plays a part uh, in the toxicity. And another way is to think about having some way using immunotherapies to increase the clearance of this. Now, biomarkers. What are biomarkers? Well, biomarkers are tests that help make the diagnosis early in the progression of the disease, maybe even before it becomes clinically present. How accurate are they? Well, we're not sure. But what I want you to think about is biomarkers, somewhat like we think about measuring cholesterol when we test for vascular disease. So we want biomarkers in early diagnosis. Having a biomarker that would pick up patients who are elderly that are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Maybe a biomarker could be an MRI, that would be possible. Also, picking up mild cognitive impairment, which is a predecessor to Alzheimer's disease. Now, the other advantage of a biomarker is we'd be able to monitor some type of therapy. So if you get a disease process that you can make a difference in the disease progression, you could maybe monitor the way the disease is going by a marker. And the candidates are the MRIs, amyloid PET scanners, and CSF values. Now this slide is a little complex, but it's interesting because it shows us how Alzheimer's disease-like changes can be picked up in patients with Alzheimer's disease before maybe they get too severe. And the vertical is the number of patients getting Alzheimer's disease. The horizontal line is that of time. The blue line is people have normal spinal fluids, and the red line in the stepwise progression shows you as there's more abnormality in the tau amyloid ratio in the spinal fluid, we get a greater chance of being accurate about these patients having the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, there is this tau beta amyloid ratio in the spinal fluid, and that's somewhat helpful. It could be helpful in the diagnosis, how specific it is, we're not certain. We know already that if you check serum studies for patients and they have ApoE44 genotype, they have a greater chance of probably being susceptible 
to Alzheimer's disease, and they're more likely to respond to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And of course, the TAW amyloid ratio may be important. Now let's talk about the neuroimaging and the dementia. Neuroimaging is like MRIs and CAT scanners. So we all know that it's important to get some neuroimaging in patients with Alzheimer's disease to rule out other kinds of problems like tumors or subdurals. Now this slide shows us on the first upper row a MRI. On the left hand of the upper row is someone who has a lot of white matter disease, what we call white matter disease in the MRI. And then the upper row on the right hand side shows someone who has atrophy with their MRI. The second row is that of a PET scanner and that shows abnormalities when you do PET scanners. The third row is very important because that's PET scanners that are used the Pittsburgh compound. And in the bottom row you see all the red and yellow. That's abnormal amyloid because this Pittsburgh compound allows us to see the amyloid on the scanning. And that's a very important consideration. Now it would be nice to be able to see atrophy in patients who have mild cognitive impairment or have early Alzheimer's disease. And this shows on the right hand side some atrophy that's seen as compared to the MRI on the left. But this is one of the slides that's most interesting. And it's measuring human amyloid imaging using Pittsburgh compound B. And this is this compound that attaches to beta amyloid. Remember beta amyloid is deposited excessively in people who have Alzheimer's. On the left hand side, the left two columns, the first vertical column is an MRI and you can see a little bit the aspect there of the atrophy. But the second row is that of the Pittsburgh PET scanner and red and yellow are abnormalities. On the right hand two columns you can see those are controls and you see none of that yellow red appearance and those are normal as compared to the left hand side which shows all the yellow red aspects. Now let's talk here a little bit about the concept of dementia symptoms in a continuum. And this graph shows from the left to right increasing time, so mild, moderate and severe, up is maximum part of disease, down is minimal part of disease. We're going to talk about four key clinical features, cognitive ability, functional ability, behavior aspects and caregiver time. So going from left early to right severe disease, we can see there's an absolute decline in cognitive ability because down means that you're more impaired. There's minimal co cognitive ability then. And you look there next at functional ability, there's a little delay. Alzheimer's patients are cognitively impaired more, but as time goes on they have more functional ability loss, so they have more difficulty. And what happens is, is their functional ability, activities of daily living is decreased. And then from mild to severe, there is more impairment of behavior. And then we have more caregiver time, more caregiver cost. So that shows cognitive ability getting worse, functional ability getting worse with a little lag, behavior problems occurring more as the disease goes on, and a greater risk for caregiver time and cost. So let's talk about the treatment of Alzheimer's. There are three drugs. We want early diagnosis, early treatment. We want to improve cognition behavior. We want to delay time to nursing home placement. And we want to reduce costs. Our drugs that we have today all do that. So the rationale has been, one, we know that acetylcholine is reduced. We know that there's glutamate excitotoxicity probably. And we know that we can modulate secretase activity here in the future with some drugs. And what we need to do is study those more. So what we want to do is use a combination of treatments. But now we have the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and the glutamate antagonists. But there's a lot of non-pharmacological therapy we can use. Exercise, good nutrition, keep your weight appropriate, reduce comorbidity like heart disease and stroke, and early screening. 
there are two classes of drugs that are approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's. They're the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and those are donepezil or Aricept. They're rivastigmine, which is Exelon, and galantamine, which is Razodyne. And then we have another drug by a different mechanism of action, a glutamate antagonist, which is Namanda or Memantine. Now these next slides here show us a picture of what these drugs can do. But before I show you the drugs and their benefit, I want to show you a slide that's very important here about cognitive decline as it occurs over time in Alzheimer's disease. So what we have here is on the left vertical bar is the amount of loss of cognitive aspects in these patients. In this case, it's mini mental state exam. And as you go down, it's worse. And the horizontal line is time. So in this case, we see that we have a greater loss of the mini mental state exam scores and patients do worse and they lose about two to four points in decline per year. Now this slide shows what Donepezil or Aricept can do or be a benefit in activities of daily living, what patients do every day. The left hand vertical bar measures the activities of daily living and the horizontal bar is the amount of time in weeks and this study went on 30 weeks. The checkered line is that of the baseline and you can see the solid blue line is placebo, it goes down that means it's worse. The red lines are above the blue. That means this drug at various doses is a benefit for activities of daily living. And this slide really is the same aspect here of the way it's structured. On the left hand side we have the cognitive aspects on the vertical. The horizontal line is time and what we see is the blue line is placebo. Above that are the drugs and so these people do better. And this is galantamine or Razodyne and we see this also is a benefit for behavioral symptoms that we talked about. So the vertical line shows more behavioral difficulty, down is bad, up is good, the horizontal line is time and what we have is the blue line is the placebo and you can see the yellow lines is the active drug and they do better. And the same case here for Namanda or Memantine. Now this is a slide on rivastigmine or Exelon and Exelon now has a patch which is of uh, benefit in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia but this tells us here the opportunity of what happens in patients who get the drug early and they do better. So this slide shows us the first 24 weeks if you're on the drug the yellow line shows you do better than the green blue line that is a placebo but if you add the drug to a patient who has placebo after those 24 weeks they get better but they never catch up. So stem cells we're going to talk briefly about they're the human embryonic stem cell, the fetal cell and the adult stem cell. Adult stem cells are difficult to control and manage sometimes they can become abnormal and be become cancer cells, sometimes you have a hard time determining exactly what type of cell they are. But a new program mainly determined in Kyoto, Japan and also in the University of Wisconsin in Madison shows skin cells of adult mice can be reprogrammed to turn into any kind of cell. So what they've done now is they've taken a virus and they have taken four human genes and they placed it into adult skin cells of mice and they've shown they can reprogram these adult skin cells to form stem cells. Now that would be very very important and it would be a way to avoid the embryonic problem and the fetal cell problem and this looks very encouraging but we need to know more about it. Now as you know human fetal and stem cell trials in Parkinson's disease in humans have not been very productive. They've had some benefit but there's been lots of complications. There are some stem cell and other aspects 
in treatment going on with Alzheimer's disease. I just want to mention again the great opportunity here that's being looked at in the amyloid cascade or the amyloid hypothesis. And we've looked at ways now to reduce the amount of amyloid by blocking its formation or by reducing its amount or by reducing its aggregation or in some way increasing its clearance. Now tonight our topic is current causes and treatment of memory loss. This is a second part of a two-part series on memory loss. I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Cummings of UCLA and Dr. Kavitz for the use of some of these slides for tonight's presentation. Now why is dementia or Alzheimer's disease important to us? It's a common disease. It affects the patient, the family, and society. The costs for this are staggering and they're increasing, $150 billion a year. There is underdiagnosis of dementia and memory loss and under treatment. Medications can definitely make a difference for the symptoms and help the patient activity of daily living and quality of life, but it doesn't and they don't change the progression of the disease. There are new advances now in therapy that are really coming soon. So why do we aggressively treat these patients with Alzheimer's? One, we want to improve cognition, activities of daily living, quality of life. We know we can improve behavior. We can improve caregiver depression, improve caregiver time, reduce costs. All of these drugs have shown to be cost effective. And we can delay nursing home placement by about a year and a half with the use of these drugs. And also, with physical therapy, we can reduce falls and morbidity and mortality. Now, the purpose of our discussion tonight on memory loss is really to give us education and information. This is for you and your families. We want to have a clarity of the issue of memory loss. Really, what is it? We want to understand and have a realistic approach to how we think about dementia, how we diagnose it, and how we treat it. We want to also know that we are really making progress, because we are. There are new things coming up all the time. We're getting a better understanding, and there is a lot of hope for all neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and even Parkinson's disease. We want to realize that knowledge is really power, and it's also hope. And we also want to be aware that we have to have reason to prepare for the future. And it's important for patients with Alzheimer's and families with Alzheimer's to really prepare for the future. So what are we talking about tonight as far as our outline? We're going to talk about six areas. We're going to talk about terminology. We're going to talk about treatment of Alzheimer's. We're going to talk about Alzheimer's itself called dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And we're going to talk about other types of dementia. Tonight, I'm going to go over various types of dementia, such as Lewy body disease, very common disease, has Parkinson features, frontal temporal dementia, a younger type of dementia that occurs in younger people, and vascular dementia, like strokes and dementia. Then we're going to talk about normal pressure hydrocephalus. And we're going to talk about this very, very interesting topic called mild cognitive impairment, or called MCI the clinical syndrome that precedes many of the clinical features of Alzheimer's disease. So now let's talk about terminology, because terminology is very important. You need to know how I think about or what I mean about terms I use. So what's dementia? It's memory loss with associated signs and symptoms that are of various types. It's a broad group of diseases that are neurodegenerative that have dementia. It's really a waste paper basket diagnosis. Mild cognitive impairment, a predecessor to Alzheimer's disease, is MCI. It's memory loss only with amnestic and non-amnestic types of MCI. Then there's Alzheimer's disease. We know about this. It's cognitive dysfunction with memory loss plus one of three symptoms, aphasia, difficulty getting words out, speaking, apraxia, difficulty with motor skills, 
accomplishing motor activities, and agnosia, difficulty with recognition. Then there's Lewy body disease, and this is a disease that's become more and more understandable and more treatable. It's memory loss in patients that have Parkinson's symptoms and signs, usually rigidity and akinesia, but not a lot of tremor, and there are fluctuatings of tension and fluctuating alertness and oftentimes very vivid visual hallucinations. So then there's frontal temporal dementia, younger onset dementia, behavior changes, memory changes, personality changes. Parkinson's disease dementia is dementia in people who have Parkinson's disease that have signs and symptoms of rigidity, akinesia, resting tremor that's prominent with asymmetry that usually get a dementia after two or three years. That's Parkinson's disease dementia. Now we know in people who have Parkinson's, about 80% of them after they've had the disease for eight to 10 years will have some cognitive impairment. They have an executive type of impairment, difficulty with planning, organizing, and spatial types of activities. Then there's normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is a hot topic. It's a triad of urinary incontinence, ataxia, and dementia. And most importantly is that if you have the diagnosis and it's difficult to diagnose, you can put a shunt in the ventricle and drain the fluid into the peritoneal cavity. Another term is neuropsychiatric aspects. And what are these? These are behavior changes, apathy, agitation, aggressiveness, delusion, depression, compulsion, hallucinations. The amyloid precursor protein is a term, APP. This is the protein that precedes the development of beta amyloid because there are substances called secretases that cleave amyloid precursor protein and allow the beta amyloid to form. Beta amyloid is a substance that's in senile plaques. And these proteins are called beta amyloid 140 and beta amyloid 142. But it's the beta amyloid 142 that's in the senile plaque mostly. It's the most toxic. It aggregates. It's usually in a diffusional state first. That's probably when it's toxic. Then it aggregates, accumulates intracellularly. The cell dies and amyloid occurs as senile plaques. And that's what this is. This shows a picture of a senile plaque. The red stain is amyloid. And it's stained because there's an anti-amyloid antibody. Now the other characteristic feature pathologically of Alzheimer's is neurofibrillary tangles. And this is made of another protein called TAW, and it's a paired helical filament of abnormal hyperphosphorylated TAW. And this neurofibrillary tangles is in neurons, which I'll show you. A neuron has a cell body, it has an axon that's like a tail, and these neurons, when they're healthy, they release a neurotransmitter that sends a biochemical signal or message to another cell's receptor at the postsynaptic receptor site. And this is a picture of a microtubule with the associated TAW, and then this hyperphosphorylated TAW is in subunits or in a helical form. And it occurs in these neurons, and that's that dark red stain. Another term is alpha-synuclein, which is a protein. It's an aggregated form of a protein, alpha-synuclein. It occurs in the body normally in the brain, but when it's abnormally aggregated, it forms Lewy bodies, and that's one of the pathological markers for idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Now, when we talk about proteins, we have to have an understanding that genes really are what dictate or generate proteins. And the neurodegenerative diseases that we talk about, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, are protein deposition diseases. Mutations in genes, either naturally that occur genetically or that occur by an actual mutation, give abnormal proteins, and they are more likely to aggregate. Now we have what we call knockout mice, that these are mice that are genetically engineered and they are changed to develop excessive amounts of amyloid and we can then study amyloid deposition. 
Mutations in genes for beta amyloid, tau, and alpha-synuclein give protein changes and lead to diseases. And this is a picture of Dr. Alzheimer. He first described the disease in 1907, observed it in a 51-year-old, described all the classical features, and described the pathology. Now, Alzheimer's is a very, very common disease. Five million patients in the United States have Alzheimer's disease. And probably for every one that's diagnosed, there's one that's not diagnosed. Most of these, about 80, 85 percent, are mild to moderate. But there are some about that are severe. Most patients that have Alzheimer's are 65 years of age or older. But if you're 85 years of age or older, you have a, about a 50 percent chance of having Alzheimer's. The actual typical lifespan of somebody with Alzheimer's is about seven to ten years. Now this is an interesting slide or cartoon that tells us about the clinical syndromes and the corresponding increasing severity of Alzheimer's disease. This is a slide that I have thanks to Jeff Cummings and it shows on the left hand side the clinical picture of no symptoms. But that little gray area shows that in some of those cases, there is some abnormal pathology. As we get mild cognitive impairment, we see there's greater pathology. And what we have then is this syndrome called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. And about 15% of those patients per year will develop Alzheimer's disease. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, you have greater amount of pathology the senile plaque, the neurofibrillary tangles, and you have more dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Now, what are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? Age, ApoE4 genotype gives you some greater predisposition. Family history certainly plays a role. Head injury, so if you had a significant head injury, you're more likely to get Alzheimer's disease probably. Smoking, hypertension, diabetes, and high homocysteine levels kind of give you the comorbidity and lead to an added on phenomenon of Alzheimer's disease. And maybe statins have an inverse relationship and maybe same way with anti-inflammatories. Estrogens, the wor their word is still not in on how estrogens play a role. Now fortunately today we have two classes of drugs approved for the treatment of dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And this is based on clinical trials, class one evidence. The first drug group is called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And what are they? They're donepezil or Aricept, rivastigmine or Exelon, which now comes orally and in a patch. And the patch has fewer side effects than the oral medication. And galantamine or Razodyne. Now that shows you we have three good drugs for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Now, glutamate antagonist is a different mechanism of action, and that works by having the medication act as an antagonist to the receptor that's a glutamate receptor on the postsynaptic receptor site. And that drug is memantine or nemanda. Now, what do we know about dementia? Well, we know that we want to think about the symptoms and signs of dementia and make the diagnosis as early as we can. We want to try to treat the patient. We want to exercise regularly. We want to control hypertension. And we want to know that if we do these things, there's a significant ability to reduce and delay dementia in most people. So exercise, watch your comorbidity, and watch hypertension. Now back to the drugs we have. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that we have cholinesterase inhibitors. Cholinesterase inhibitors are donepezil, exelon, and razodyne. And they allow more available acetylcholine to reach the postsynaptic receptor site. And they do this by inhibiting a substance called cholinesterase. And they allow more available acetylcholine. So it's good to inhibit that cholinesterase, which normally would break down acetylcholine. On the left-hand side, we have a cartoon of memantine or nemanda. And this memantine acts at the postsynaptic receptor site, 
called the NMDA receptor, and that allows this synaptic area to work more normally. Now, we've known for years that cholinergic pathways are present in the brain, and they originate here in the basal forebrain, deep inside the brain, and they spread throughout the whole brain, and that's why acetylcholine is an important neurotransmitter. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's we've talked about, it is cognitive dysfunction with memory impairment with one or more of the following, aphasia, apraxia, or agnosia. And many people present with a disturbance of executive function, difficulty with planning, organization, sequencing, abstract difficulties. And that's especially for frontal temporal dementia and for Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease. Now, the clinical disease progression is shown in this slide. On the left-hand side, the vertical bar is mini mental state exam. Up is good, down is bad. We have mild, moderate, and severe as we go from left to right. And we see on the bottom horizontal line years from the diagnosis. The average patient lives about nine years. So we can see on the left-hand side, first there's cognitive symptoms, then you make the diagnosis, there's loss of functional ability, behavioral problems, and then you get nursing home placement. Now I'm going to briefly mention about markers. We talk about markers. We want them to help us make the diagnosis early. And markers can be thought of as like cholesterol as monitoring vascular disease, but we don't have that refined as well for Alzheimer's. So it'd be nice to have a marker for early risk patients when they're elderly or mild cognitive impairment, but we don't have a drug that really alters the disease progression. We want to monitor therapy with markers possibly, and that would be a good idea. And what are the candidates? Well, candidates can be the ratio of ta to beta amyloid in the spinal fluid, or it can be also MRIs or PET scanners. And I just want to mention one that is really up and coming and looks like a very, very good test if we can figure out its sensitivity. This is the human amyloid imaging using Pittsburgh compound B. And we have on the left-hand side the dementia Alzheimer's type that is seen. And the first row, vertical row, is the MRIs with atrophy. The next vertical row on the left-hand side is the evidence of this Pittsburgh compound picking up amyloid in the brain. And it's shown by red and yellow. On the right-hand side is the controls. And you can see they're not there. And this is a bad amyloid plaque that we see with the Pittsburgh compound. This is the amyloid that's deposited here in the senile plaque. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Well, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. Age is the greatest risk factor. It's a syndrome. Everybody has their own significant picture. Treatments are available, and there are going to be more treatments available in time. We have here also dementia with Lewy body disease. How does that differ from Alzheimer's? Well, most importantly, it's a different type of dementia. They have cognitive decline, but many of the people with Lewy body disease have Parkinson features, and they have rigidity, akinesia, but usually they have it within the first year or two along with dementia, and these people also have fluctuations of cognition, attention, and visual hallucinations are very, very common in Lewy body disease. There's also a syndrome called REM behavior disorder that occurs where people, when they're asleep, have the ability to act out, yell, scream, or grab things and be very dangerous to themselves or others when they are sleeping. That's called REM behavior disorder, and patients with Lewy body disease have this. But people with Lewy body disease have alpha-synuclein, which is a different kind of protein. And we talked about that, but they also have some of the Alzheimer's findings pathologically also. Most importantly, patients with Lewy body disease have a robust clinical response to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Now, we talked about frontal temporal lobar dementia. It's a newer term. It's not an amyloid beta pathology, and it has three important forms which I'll briefly go into, the frontal temporal dementia type, the somatic dementia, 
and the non-fluent aphasia. Frontal temporal dementias are younger in onset, occur between the ages of 45 and 65. Many of them have a positive family history, and they're very common in some families. Oftentimes, they present with behavior changes, apathy, lack of insight. They're more rapidly progressive, and we do not have any medication that we know that's a benefit. They don't respond probably to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. It's a very genetic disease. Chromosome 17 probably plays a role. And mutations are seen in this taw or this microtubule area. Now, the neurofibrillary tangle that is seen with taw and taw abnormalities certainly can be seen in some of the patients with frontal temporal dementia. Now, what's vascular dementia? Vascular dementia is common. It's a very heterogeneous entity clinically. People have mixed features. Risk factors are obvious, heart disease, hypertension, high cholesterol, stroke. They oftentimes have executive dysfunction, as we talked about. MRI show strokes. They may show white matter disease. And the only treatment is that of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which work well with that, like they do with Alzheimer's, in treating the underlying cause, exercise, and weight loss. And this is a picture of a patient with stroke and vascular dementia. You can see the black areas that picture the stroke. Now, what is prion disease? Prion disease is a disease that's an infectious agent, has three different types, and they are sporadic, familial, and the mad cow disease. Then there's normal pressure hydrocephalus. We talked about that. It has the triad of gait disorder or ataxia, cognitive difficulty, and incontinence. Large ventricles are present, and if this looks like it's clinically, you can shunt the patient. Now, let's briefly talk about mild cognitive impairment, MCI. It is of two types, amnestic and non-amnestic, and it precedes dementia of the Alzheimer's type, especially the amnestic type. Now, the amnestic type is when there's memory impairment and there's loss of recognition, or especially recognition of the memory difficulty. Non-amnestic type is when there is recognition that is intact, and that's mainly with other types of neurodegenerative disease, less likely Alzheimer's disease. Now, MCI risk factors are ApoE4, or hippocampal atrophy, and markers may be abnormal, such as the PET scan and the PET scan amyloid abnormalities. On autopsy, most cases of MCI will have Alzheimer's pathology, and there can be some comorbidity. But mostly what I want you to take away from this is it's a transition state between mild memory changes of aging and early stages of dementia. It's an incipient stage of dementia, of a neurodegenerative disease. It really differs from normal aging. About 12 to 15 percent of non-demented subjects over the age of 65 have mild cognitive impairment. Now, mild cognitive impairment really is noted by the patient or the caregiver or the spouse. Memory impairment for age and education is greater than would be expected. There's preserved general cognitive function. Activities of daily living are normal, and the patient really isn't demented. It is just memory difficulty. There is progressive changes, and it's a decline in most of these cases. About 15% of patients with mild cognitive impairment will progress every year to dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Now, the treatment of mild cognitive impairment is very interesting, and there have been a number of trials, and there's some in progress at the present time. But by and large, Aricept or Donepazil has had about four trials and reduced the risk of progression to Alzheimer's disease for the first 12 months. And if you had ApoE44 genotype, it would reduce it for about the first 24 months. So hence, by using this drug, you get an opportunity to delay the symptoms from 12 to 24 months. Now let's briefly mention here the concept of the amyloid hypothesis 
or the amyloid cascade. Cleavage of amyloid precursor protein to form amyloid A-beta-42 is the basis of the amyloid hypothesis. And you can see amyloid precursor protein here is a transmembrane protein, and the beta secretase cleaves part of the amyloid precursor protein off, and then the gamma secretase cleaves the other part off, giving A beta amyloid, and that deposits as the amyloid plaque. So the accumulation of A beta protein in the brain is the primary event in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. And this slide just shows points and possibilities of intervention and therapeutic management of this amyloid cascade. And we've looked at ways to reduce the amount of amyloid by blocking its formation or by reducing its amount or by reducing its aggregation or in some way increasing its clearance. So what have we talked about tonight? We've talked about the terminology which we've discussed, treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We've talked about other types of dementia, the Lewy body disease, the frontal temporal dementia, and vascular dementia. And we've talked a little bit about normal pressure hydrocephalus, and we've discussed mild cognitive impairment, which is called MCI, and it is the state clinically that precedes most cases of dementia of the Alzheimer's type. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Learn all you can about your medical problems. Be well and be safe. I want to thank you again. I'm Dr. D. Silver. Good night. This series of programs has been funded by the generosity of the Bell Foundation in honor of Glenn W. Bell, Jr., founder of Taco Bell, and by Elaine and David Darwin.